By the way, Cheyana is going to be with us tonight. He's a great friend of the house, a great apostolic leader from Southern California. And I'm so glad he's coming. It's always fun when, he, when he's here. He's a dear friend. He and I met on the floor. <laughs> Literally. We, we met on the floor. We were laid out, and our heads were close enough that some prophetic guy walked by us, grabbed both of our hands, joined him, and began to prophesy. And, and that's a strange way to meet another guy, you know, but, but, it, but it worked. We, he is from Southern California. Of course, we're in Northern California, and we just made a real partnership in that moment uh, for the state of California. So anyway, Che will be here tonight, and I uh, always look forward to seeing my friend. Um, I, I just got back Friday night from uh, Edmonton, Canada. How many Canadians do we have here? You live in a cold country. The best definition, that's why you're here. <laughs> yeah. The best de definition I heard of Edmonton was, we have 10 months of winter and two months of bad sledding. <laughs> it, was, it was so cold. And I, I, I was moaning and groaning, and then the, it, was, it was just freezing is all. There's ice everywhere, you know, and I was moaning and groaning about the temperature, and they said, you should have been here last week. It was 40 below zero. I began to rejoice. I began to rejoice. You know, I, I was actually in that area like 30 years ago. It was my only, my only other time, uh, like 30 years earlier, and, uh, and it was uh, the night I, I landed in the morning, that night, previous night, it was 28 below zero. And uh, it was, I had a mustache at the time. I could actually feel my mustache hair squeak as they rubbed next to each other. I didn't know it was even possible. I didn't know they made that noise, but I could, I could, hear, I could hear something going on with that hair. And in three days, it was 70 degrees. It was a 100 degree turnaround. 100 degrees in three days because they had what they called Chinook winds. Winds, Chinook winds. It's a miracle. It didn't come while I was there, I was hoping. I was, I was hoping that God would gift us again with the Chinook winds, but that was a one-time experience apparently. So anyway, um, I do have uh, something to read. Women and cats will do as they please. Men and dogs should relax and get used to the idea. <laughs> I, I thought it was funny. Anyway, three friends from a local congregation were asked, when you're in your casket and friends and congregation members are mourning over your loss, over your death, what would you like for them to say? Artie said, I would like them to say I was a wonderful husband, a fine spiritual leader, and a great family man. Eugene commented, I would like them to say I was a wonderful teacher and a servant of God who made a huge difference in people's lives. Al said, I would like them to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> That's so, that's so dumb, but I, it, it, it may speak to either IQ or whatever. Anyway, all right, we'll leave it right there. We'll just leave it there. I want to talk to you uh, today about the, the mandate for miracles that is upon our lives. It is in the bold preaching of the gospel that the hand of God is released to demonstrate his love, his power. Jesus did not give us power and authority so we could sit in a pew and wait for the rapture. He gave us power and authority to deal, to deal with the works of the devil. He gave us power and authority to silence that illegal voice that torments people with, people with lies and deceptions. And he's given us the great privilege to walk in the anointing that Jesus himself walked in. It's a miracle mandate. In Romans 15, I forget the verse reference. I think it's like 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there. At any rate, Paul makes this statement. He says, he's gone to these certain cities, and he said, 
in mighty signs and wonders, he has fully preached the gospel. In mighty signs and wonders, fully preached the gospel. How many of you want to fully share the good news of the kingdom? It requires miracles to be fully preached. And it's the bold decree, as you look through Scripture over and over again, it's that bold confession of faith, that bold uh, declaration, that bold preaching. Preaching is not just from the pulpit. It's just one-on-one. It's over coffee, but it's that confident, it's the confidence in Christ where we share the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And that just draws, literally helps to manifest the hand of God in given situations. But I want to kind of come through the back door on this subject because <clears throat> what Uh, what was in my heart this morning was to bring to you two portions of Scripture that are actually used against those who pray for the sick, those who pursue the demonstration of power. There are a couple portions of Scripture that are frequently sent to individuals like myself that are to discourage me from praying for the sick or to expose the heresy or whatever is involved. And it's not in defense of that because they're not in the room. Um, it, it's, it's just so that you and I would be deeply entrenched in the assignment that God's given us. I may stink at what God's called me to do, but I don't have the luxury of changing the assignment. I don't have the luxury of changing what he said to do just because I don't do it well. And what's done often is people will retreat to what they do well and forsake what he's called us to do. We don't have that luxury. Our gifts, our skills are valuable. They're important. They are part of our offering to the Lord. But we cannot lose track of the very fact that God has called us to invade the impossible and demonstrate his love, demonstrate his purity, demonstrate his power. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at today. So the first portion of Scripture we'll look at is in uh, Matthew chapter 7. In fact, both uh, portions of Scripture we're going to look at today are in uh, Matthew Uh, the Gospel of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 7. Matthew uh, 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'd like to suggest that there are actually two parts to the lesson Jesus is trying to instruct this crowd in. The first is concerning the will of God. He said, just because you, if you call me Lord, it has to be demonstrated by your obedience. Interestingly, Jesus was uh, in a similar crowd and his disciples came to him and said, your, your, your mom's outside waiting for you and your brothers, and your sisters, your family's out there waiting for you. And Jesus made this statement that probably sounded rude at the time, but he said, anyone who obeys me, anyone who does the will of God, those are my brothers, my sisters, my mother. What is he saying? He's saying, you can't find your identity apart from obedience. Those who do the will of God, those who yield to the assignment, the commission that God has given, that's where we, we it's like identity in Christ is like two-part epoxy. Obedience seals what was revealed in Scripture. Yes, Bill, that was an extremely good point. (laughs) Two-part epoxy. You got it. All right. We'll just leave it there. I was expecting a little little bigger smile, at least. That was one of those loud smiles. Something like that, yeah. I'm I'm teasing you because I'm in a teasing mood. It was sunny yesterday. Glory to God. And the last time I saw it, sunny today. I am so happy. You know what I did yesterday? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I walked around my property just enjoying sun. We got reacquainted. I hadn't seen him for a while. We got re- reacquainted. <laughs> oh, my. 
two parts to this. He said, just because you call me Lord, if you don't do the will of God, you can't call me Lord. You, you, you can't call me Lord and not obey. Right? So what is the will of God? Well, the broadest definition is found in what's what we usually call the Lord's Prayer, which is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's the reality of that world changing, affecting the reality of this world. Every other commission Jesus gave, every other assignment he gave was actually an expression of that overall commission. The overall commission, heaven to earth. It became practical when he said, I'm going to send you out two by two. You go into a home, heal the sick that are there. Find the peace, fill people. Minister to them, make sure deliverance comes. Cast out demons, cleanse lepers, raise the dead. That's very specific. So what is the will of God? If they're sick, heal them. All right, that's the will of God. So when he says, he says, don't call me Lord and you disobey me when I give you a commission, pray for the sick. I'm not saying that's the only way we demonstrate the will of God, but don't ignore it because it's, it's part of the program. Don't say he's my Lord and yet you don't pray for the sick. You don't confront somebody's tormented with dreams. Well, I don't know how to deal with demons. Tell them to leave. Start there. Start there. Just, just, just pretend like you're standing in Jesus' clothing in his shoes and use his name and come against that demon. Tell them to break off that person's life. Just a, this nonsense of torment stops today. But, but we, you know, you, it, the whole point was, you, you can't call me Lord and not do uh, what I, what I, the will of God, the will of my Father in heaven. The second verse, though, verse 22, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons, and done many wonders in your name? What group is that? Those are the people that don't have the relationship with God but they know enough, enough spiritual truths to demonstrate his authority and prophesy and heal the sick. Doing the will of God. So the first group, they don't even try. The second group, they try, but there's no relationship. Depart from me, I never knew you. So people will say, well, here, this is evidence. We're not supposed to pray for the sick and stuff. No, it's the opposite. Here's the deal. If people who don't have a relationship with Jesus can use his name and people can get healed, those who know Jesus have no excuse. Jesus didn't give us the spirit of the resurrected Christ so that we could sit down and wait for some, someone else to do something. He put the spirit of resurrection in us because he's looking for us to confront death, loss, destruction, all those signs of the enemy's work. And that is our assignment. You were born for this. Yes, amen. Verse 23 says, I'll declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. So we have the question, what's the one thing more important than knowing God? There is one thing, it's him knowing you. I have certain heroes in my life. They may be athletes. You know, I grew up with Willie Mays as my uh, hero. I used to watch every, every time I could go to a game or anything. I'd, everything about Willie Mays, I would, you know, he was birth, his birthday is May 6th. God was kind enough to me to allow my firstborn, Eric, to be born on May 6th. It's just the mercy of God. But I've never met him, and I don't know him. I can tell you facts about him. I saw him play. I'd see the home runs. I would see all the amazing catches and throws and all the stuff that he did. Love baseball. But I don't know him. And yes, God knows everything about you and everything about me. But it's only as we open and be totally honest, totally transparent, transparent before this one who knows everything. See, the scripture says I'm supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit implies a relationship with the Holy Spirit who enables and directs me in the true privilege of giving honor to who God is. But the second is in truth. Truth means nothing hidden. 
nothing hidden. So the one thing more important than knowing God is Him knowing you. Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he says, those who do the will of God are known by God. I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 12. The second portion of Scripture that is used often to discourage people from praying for the sick is found here, verse 38 and 39. Let's read that, Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. I always love when I'm given this verse. An evil and adulterous, you know, you're just praying for the sick, want to see somebody get healed. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for signs and wonders. That motivates you to pray for the sick, doesn't it? <laughs> just take a quick look at the context. Verse 9 of Matthew 12. Now when he had departed from there, he went to their synagogue. Behold, there was a man there with a withered hand. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? And he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more, of, how much more value then is man than a sheep? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Of how much more value is a baby in the womb than a baby whale? It's a twisted form of logic. It's a twisted effort to express righteousness, to disregard humanity, and to try to spare and save everything else. Both should matter, but not above a human life. Jesus here, and I'm preaching to the choir, so there's no, you get no points for preaching to the choir, so let's move on. So uh, uh, verse uh, 13, he says, to, uh, he says to the man, stretch out your hand. As he stretched it, it was made whole. Verse 15, Jesus knew what the Pharisees were plotting against him. He withdrew from there. Great multitudes followed him. He healed them all. Verse 22, then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute. He healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Verse 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign. <laughs> Did you get it? What's wrong with this picture? They were looking for something that they could control, a sign like a pillar of fire, water out of a rock, which Israel had that experience, manna on the ground. Because of the callousness of their heart, they had no regard for the well-being of the people in their community. Can you imagine knowing a man who has a paralyzed arm, a shriveled up arm that he's never been able to use his whole life, so it limits him in what he's able to do with his life, the work that he can do. Everything is restricted because of this crippling affliction. And Jesus comes to that neighbor of yours and you watch as that man stretches out his hand and he's completely restored and healed. What does it take to see that and be unmoved? Unmoved. To see another neighbor who's never been able to say a word in his life and in fact he can't even hear. And Jesus comes and suddenly the ears are open. Well, what about the crowd that follows Jesus out of town and you watch as you see every single person with affliction gets healed and for it to not move you. See, the miracles of God were not for entertainment. They're to restore us to God's original intent. They're to bring the justice to the demonic realm that came to kill, steal, and destroy. That's got to bother us. We must stop creating 
theological reasons for a disease to exist. We, we can't say, well, it's, it's, uh, I'm just getting older and this, this is just what happens. Uh, my parent, my father had it, my grandfather had it. Sure enough, I'm going to have it. No, s- stop it. Stop creating. Stop adjusting your understanding of how the kingdom of God works and shaping the kingdom according to the, the laws of, of nature. It's, it's not that way. It's the other way around. And, and, and we, when we think that way, we actually make room for certain things to flourish that were never intended to flourish. You may be in a struggle, in a battle. Well, just stay. You know, don't, don't quit now. Don't quit now. S- stay on course with dealing with that which the enemy has released against you. One of our elders here in, in, uh, in the church uh, had a, a grandson uh, with extreme autism. His, I don't know how it works, but there's some kind of a number system. And, and his was, you know, I think normal is like the number of 11, and he was like 26 or something. It was just, it was autistic extreme. And they took a year, and they would just pray for him day after day after day. And slowly it changed. The last time they had him tested, he was like number four. He's more normal than normal children. He's like extra normal. He's like normal on steroids. You know, to change from that to that. See, all of Jesus' miracles were to restore people to God's intent for them to live in health, to live with life, to live abundantly, to live with joy, to live fulfilled, uh, being able to fulfill our assignment, to use both hands to work, etc. So Jesus would perform these miracles to restore people to God's intent, and the Pharisees were, were, uh, were not moved by it. And so Jesus gives them a little sermon here that I find quite interesting. He said, an evil adult ge- generation, verse 39, seeks after a sign. Look at verse 40. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with his generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Then the queen of the south will rise up. That's the queen of Sheba. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment against this generation and condemn it, For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Here's two unique parts of ministry, and I I want to just give me your attention here for a moment. Every one of us have been summoned by God, assigned by God, to function in two realms of ministry, overt and covert, power and wisdom. Power brings the breakthrough. Wisdom taps into the the way of life that God intended for us. It's that which enables us to sustain the breakthrough, but also to position us to truly learn how to reign in life. Money doesn't run my life. I manage it. Relationships don't govern me. I govern relationships. Reigning in life. Wisdom gives us access to a lifestyle that testifies of his nature, but it doesn't just testify, it invites. It comes, as it's displayed, it invites others into that same experience. So Jesus uses two interesting examples. Jonah preaches to Nineveh. Nineveh repents. It's the bold preaching of the gospel that actually attracts the miracle hand of God to be released in any given environment. You can see this in Mark 16. You can see it in Acts chapter 4. It's repeatedly throughout the scripture that when there was boldness, there was the hand of God working wonders. So here we have Jonah going to a people he didn't even want to minister to, and he preached to them, and they were moved to repent, and they cried out to God for forgiveness. And one of the two greatest revivals in the Bible happened in the Old Testament, Nineveh. The second one, which I think is is uh, the greatest, in in my opinion, is uh, uh, Ephesus. Extraordinary, extraordinary move of God in in the city of Ephesus. So here we have (coughs) 
Jesus is announcing a strange thing. He says, the people who are in Nineveh that are now dwelling in heaven are going to stand in a day of judgment and they're going to point out to you what you missed because you had an opportunity. And they had a less opportunity than you and they repented and turned because they were impacted by the power of the preaching of the gospel. And then he's going to say, and there's this lady that tra- traveled halfway around the planet to get to this guy just to listen to wisdom. And she is the example of one moved by, I'm going to, wisdom, another term I'll use, divine reasoning. It's thinking from God's perspective. That really is what the gift of wisdom is. And so here she's saying, here Jesus is saying, she will stand and point to this generation that ignored the moment they were given. They were given an opportunity to see how God thinks, and yet they rejected it to hold to their own opinions and their own conviction. So what he's doing here is he's confronting. You've missed your call for overt ministry to demonstrate power. You've missed your call for covert ministry, the subtle the operating in wisdom. It's that which is like leaven, just gets worked into the dough, and it has an effect on everybody around you. God's called us to both. Everybody in this room has um, access to these two things. And probably everybody in this room has one that they prefer over the other. So start paying more attention to the other. Because we want to have power and wisdom. We want to walk on legs that are the same length. We don't want to hobble through life because we have a strong point and we have a point that we've ignored. God's called us to demonstrate this good news, this gospel of the kingdom through power and through wisdom. So this passage that is often used to describe an adulterous generation seeks for a sign is actually talking to a religious group of people that want the demonstrations of power for their sense of personal control and their sense of entertainment, completely unmoved with a condition of people that are broken and hurting. And I would say to everybody in this room, you've been called to the miraculous, but it's not so that your self-esteem could grow. It's because there's people around us that are hurting. It's not so that we can be entertained by yet another miracle, but it's because, it's because there's people around us that are filled with broken situations and they're looking for somebody who knows God, who believes God to step into their life and say, I will stand with you on this matter. Let's go ahead and stand. We've had We've had a string of miracles. I'll talk about it more later. Actually, um, I'll just mention, a few weeks ago at the Send, we had a woman healed. Some of you have heard the story already. 38 years, Lyme's disease, last 10 years, mostly in bed for 10 years, was completely healed. They sent a video of her running around a swimming pool, just beside herself. The entire family's beside themselves with joy. When I shared it here and we prayed for those with Lyme's disease, Um, Someone, a friend of mine was here visiting from Nashville. She stood in proxy for two young ladies with Lyme's disease, actually the mother as well, uh, bedridden, hardly able to function or to move, and they were, all three were healed, uh, healed of juvenile arthritis. Listen, it's just what Jesus does. One of our students several years ago, this this is a good one, and then I'm going to pray for you. I've been waiting for just this one good one. (laughs) I'm teasing. On a ministry trip, one of our students gave a word of knowledge of God healing kidney stones. This guy who's now become my friend has had kidney stones every, every, about every two months for 27 years. And if you've ever had them, I had them once. It was good to get it out of my system. (laughs) Wow. Wow. 27 years, prayed for him. It's interesting, he was born with three kidneys, but two were diseased. So they took two, left him with one, and he had kidney stones every every couple months for 27 years. Somebody called out word of knowledge, kidney stones. 
his wife and his kids made him stand up. That's what wives and kids are for. <laughs> Some of us are a little slow. We need someone with a cattle prod to help us. <laughs> he stood up and he was healed. No more kidney stones. He went back to the doctor because of another issue, hurt his back or something. They took x-rays and they said, well, they, we need to do this or whatever. He said, and both kidneys are healthy. And he said, he said, wait a minute. He said, look at the report here. I only have one. And he looked at it. He said, oh, these must be the wrong x-rays. And so they did it again. The Lord created the second kidney. Ah, come on. That's good. So listen, it has nothing to do with your intellect, your intelligence, your ability to imagine what God can do. It just comes down to obedience. It was a good thing. All the student prayed for was no kidney stones. He didn't know it would spill over into the creation of a new kidney. He's, he's actually getting the doctor's report so we can be able to celebrate that one. But All right, so put your hands in front of you. Lord, I pray for great breakthrough in the area of power and breakthrough in the area of wisdom. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Now hold your places. I want to have ministry team come up quickly. Ministry team, come quickly. We want to end with having people uh, that still need prayer to come forward. So quickly actually means uh, faster than you're doing it. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, you'll find that in, in uh, not Webster's, uh, in Johnson's Dictionary. Yeah, come quickly. We want to open it up for, for you to receive prayer. If you'd hold your places, <laughs> look at how fast they're running. It's awesome. If you'd hold your places, please, for just a moment, come up and tell us what to do, and I'll get to the back door.